Welcome back to The Lateral Show. It's another edition of The Lateral Show. This is the theme song for The Lateral Show. Welcome to The Lateral Show. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's The Lateral, lateral show. show. Fasten, Fasten your seatbelts, because here, here we, we go. go. Welcome back to another edition of The Lateral Show, a sideways look at fantasy football. My name is Herms on Twitter, at HermsNFL, joined as always by my co-host, E equals MC Lateral. What is up, my guy? Uh, Maryland's losing 53-46 to in college basketball, so that could be better. Uh, But other than that, you know, eats and greets as always, season's eatings, and it is the season of a... 51 to 49 Democratic majority in the Senate because Raphael Warnock has defeated Herschel Walker, a man who truly terrified me with the prospect of being my senator. Yeah, you know, and I was a little concerned at first when they said there was going to be a runoff because I was like, there's no way Warnock is beating that guy in a foot race. It's just not like we already know Herschel Walker's 40 (laughs) time. Like he's way faster. Yeah, I mean, but he took a lot of wear and tear over those years playing. So Warnock, you know, with his like sprightly reverendy knees where he just kind of stands there a lot, you know, he might actually have a little more in the tank. That is, You know that Herschel Walker doesn't have CTE. CTE has Herschel Walker. Oh God. I mean, look, that's, (laughs) it's, it's a good way to describe it. And, you know, now that we've heard another voice, another guest back on the show for the first time since what, before week one, I think it's been a while. We've definitely it's been a while. We have lacked in that department. But you know this man as the king of hot, spicy goodness over there with the big time flavor co. And you also know, like, look, like so whenever you go to fantasy sixpack.net, you look up the waiver wire. I enjoy my article that I do. But if you want to cross-reference my picks, you're like, I like what Herms had to say, but let's go ahead and see what somebody else has to say. What Bo does over there at that 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 fantasy pros waiver wire article i'll tell you, between you and fitz and debro like it's a very it's a very good column so ladies and gentlemen bo mcbrayer mr bo mcbig time himself welcome to the program thanks for having me on again i appreciate you both i love you both um this is this is a fun show to be a part of yeah all love um, yeah, uh, Herschel Walker, part of the best trade in Cowboys history, maybe the best trade in NFL history back in the early 90s. What spurred on that dynasty in the early 90s for the Cowboys was them dealing Herschel Walker to the Vikings for every draft pick they would ever have, apparently. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, th- th- that is how I think I will choose to remember Herschel Walker because uh, the other version is not one that I definitely... Uh... Herschel Walker <laughs> is like 90s, is like country music. He he kind of hit the skids at around the year two thousand three. It's like but pre two thousand three Herschel Walker, we love that guy. Post two thousand three Herschel Walker is a pandering sack of excrement. Yeah, we can we can pretend country music was good back in two thousand and three. Look, okay, I will I will take I will t- defend this take <sighs> to to my death. What Rascal Flats was doing? Oh my god. Look, look, okay, look, man, early if it's not a guy named Johnny or Willie singing it, I don't want to hear it. And Waylon's also acceptable. And yes. Shooter. There's quite a few. Yeah. Like that, but yes, there was pandering bullshit in country music all the way through those eras. But we like the outlaws. We like the guys that that, that did the music in the face of the establishment. That's sure. why we love those guys, those characters. But Rascal Flats, like what Herms is saying, is they were part of the establishment, but they were so musically gifted that they transcended the genre in probably a negative way after they faded from from prominence. Is like they they paved the way for all this bull crap that we have on the radio these days. So yes, I'm going to stand by Herschel Walker is country music. <laughs> well, when life is a highway, you got to ride it all night long. And uh, I think with that, we should ride into uh, being on our soapbox, which. Bo kind of did already there. Yeah, I mean, like, 
that's a great take for the soapbox from a guest if I've ever seen one. Real quick, just want to add. On this show, we will be talking about the San Francisco situation and also middling tight ends. There we go. That's the preview. (laughs) All right. Do we typically preview the show before we get into the soapbox? I I try to introduce and tease something that we're talking about. Okay. At least okay. San Francisco thing's great because I live an hour and a half away from, from the bay. And so it's it's glad, glad it's glad it's great for one of us because it's not great for me, but we'll get into that later. Um, on our soapboxes. Yes. yes. Well, you want me to go real quick? Uh, yeah, for sure. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of the Niners, as you may have noticed over the past 24 hours, I ran a poll on Twitter as to who should the Niners start at quarterback. You guys you almost did me proud. And you still did on a certain level because the filter in, it was 44.9% of the vote triggering a runoff with our second place candidate. Brock Purdy is the, pe- the guy you want to start for the Niners. But number two, ahead of Josh Johnson with 10.2% of the vote. And then Baker Mayfield, now with the Los Angeles Rams with 15% of the vote. You all picked a squirrel with 29.9% of the vote. And I got to say, I, I am proud. As, as much as I like seeing the squirrel ultimately win, and I think if we do send this to a runoff, the squirrel will come away with a surprise victory. Um, I'm glad that... Surprise, but just. It's a I'm, just I'm, victory. I'm just glad to see that the fantasy football community knew, or at least 127 of you knew, that a squirrel is a better option under center than Baker Mayfield. And that is yeah. why I am so surprised that the Los Angeles Rams... We should be so are, proud of our community right now. Oh my God. The Rams are going to pay him the rest of his contract because they a had to pick him off of waivers. $1.3 million so that he maybe loses a uh, like practice battle to John Wolford. Like, because that's what's going to happen, right? Wolford has well, Wolford, looked, Wolford's he's hurt looked too, better. Yeah. He, yes. He so that beat, is a, yeah, he has that to beat Bryce concern. Perkins. He has to beat Bryce which Perkins, which is still up there. I think, to be fair, Baker Mayfield, like, it, it probably goes a squirrel, Baker Mayfield, and then Bryce Perkins. Bryce Perkins has looked objectively terrible. <laughs> like, I, I don't want to be that guy, but let's be clear. Like, Brock Purdy may have struggled to make a throw longer than five yards, but like Bryce Perkins is bad. (laughs) Anything is better than that. I don't know about that because I, when watching in college, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Debbie C2C guy myself. I I recruit all, I, I watch film from high school to the pros. Brock Purdy in college was a four year compiler. He holds all these school records because can you name another Iowa State quarterback off the top of your head? Oh, again, like I think he was nope. just in becoming Mr. Irrelevant <sighs> in the draft. Bryce Perkins, at least for fantasy's sake, is a better fantasy option than Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy, we were afraid, was not going to get drafted. I was more afraid that he was going to get drafted, and I laughed until my stomach hurt when the 49ers took him at the very end of the draft because what I saw on tape from Brock Purdy was a guy with no arm strength, no his release time it could be measured on a sundial and we're talking about a guy who only performed well with rhythmic play action passes like you said low a dot to guys who i mean that that's what it's a perfect spot for him a perfect spot for any quarterback where even a squirrel could run that offense and i i think i voted for squirrel i'm not afraid of it because Brock Purdy the, was squirrel's my the correct QB. answer yeah, Brock Purdy was my QB 21 of that class. QB 21. And he was drafted, I think it's QB 7 or 8. Because it was an all-time bad class. And he was still 21 for me. Brock Purdy is awful. And he's going to get exposed. Even with just that that four three and a half quarters of game tape is the rest of these opponents the 49ers are going to have. That's gonna make They're going to make Brock Purdy's life a living hell. Because he is a terrible quarterback. And fortunately, we've got a huge programming block to really break down that situation because it's a huge part of, you know, what's going to be talked about this week for sure. And, you know, I've got some interesting thoughts on that as well, and I'm really looking forward to getting to that, but we cannot without me also hopping on my soapbox. Going off of what you said about Baker Mayfield there, McLateral, uh, I am floating this theory out, not because I believe it's remotely true, but because 
this would be way more fun if it were actually true. What if, and bear with me, this has all been a long con on the part of Baker Mayfield to work his way to a team that, when healthy, actually has good receivers. What if he purposefully was horrible <laughs> for the Carolina Panthers, only to eventually be waived, only to eventually find his way to the Rams because he knew it would be advantageous? So it's complete he, mat shit, but it would be I'm hilarious, gonna, wouldn't it? I'm, I'm going to undo your theory in one fell swoop. Yeah, name me one wide receiver on the Los Angeles Rams right now who's healthy and better than DJ Moore. I said when they're like he will have worked. But he's his way not going to gonna be on the team when any of them are healthy because they're going to cut him after a year. Maybe, but and you know again, why? Because they get a supplemental fifth round pick if another team signs him next year. Not only that, but like let's be clear, like they're going to. He would only be a backup, and I think he still has some starter aspirations, wrong as they may be. And, like, Matthew Stafford is the starting quarterback of the Los Angeles Rams until that contract is up. Like, he just did. That's a while. That's but a while. with the concussions and the spinal cord, he may retire. I don't know. It's a goofy theory. I know it has no merit, but it's more fun. It's more fun. It is more fun. I will give you that. So yeah. work with me, everybody con. out there, everybody out in the lateral universe, all you six packers, work with me on this batshit crazy theory that absolutely has no merit whatsoever because <laughs> we choose fun on this show. That <laughs> now, real real quick, I will say that Brock Purdy, as bad as he is, and we're gonna get into like as bad as he is here shortly. He actually had more intended air yards per pass attempt in this season so far than Bryce Perkins. Now, yes, I get that like Bryce Perkins at least has some mobility to him. Like that is a boost for fantasy. But like if you're getting beat on intended air yards by a guy who literally like can't throw the ball like further than six yards, that's a real problem. It definitely is. It definitely is a little bit, you know, but again, it's a big topic. So we got some, but Bo, if there's anything that you would like to hop on your soapbox and talk about, by all means, go ahead, and then we will get into the fastest minute in fantasy football recapping. How happy were you guys to see Deshaun Watson struggle? Oh, that, that was great. That was great. I got no complaints. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. That, my soapbox is that a little bit of rust will fade. Deshaun Watson will return to form. He's yep. a really talented player. He's an excellent NFL quarterback. His rust will wear off far, far before any kind of um, any kind of improvements are felt by the people he affected. So that's what I want to step on is saying, "Hey, Deshaun, had you had a pretty bad day there, bro? Well, I'm here to say good. You, I hope you have plenty more in your future because maybe just maybe for a split second." You'll feel just a hint, a fraction of the shitstorm that you caused 24 separate people. Maybe. If not, more power to you, bro. Hope you get the help you need. He has a better chance of uh, winning a Super Bowl before he ever fixes his image. Like, just straight it's up. It's not even like, image. It's like, hey, maybe just show us that you're a grown up with uh, contrition. And maybe, uh, maybe take some get, take some fault for something you did. Like yeah, I, just I, just exclaiming your innocence isn't doing it for anybody. That's the even issue. the people I, that are on your side just want some honesty out of you, bro. That that's the issue. I think to show contrition, you have to be contrite. And Deshaun Watson doesn't think he's done anything wrong, so he's not right. going to be contrite. Exactly. And that's why, like, is cathartic as it could be to see him do poorly and he did poorly and was definitely rusty for me it's just not going to change the fact that like he abused his position to sexually assault multiple women and you know that's just not okay and unfortunately so, the do, end of that story is going to be he ends up having a successful career in the nfl before I very ceremoniously changed my major in the middle of my college experience I did pre-law and the phrase from the law library that sticks out and keeps replaying in my mind is a simple pattern of predatory behavior, modus operandi. And his could not be clearer. Yep. A pattern of predatory behavior. 
I would agree. Whether his whether his crimes or or indiscretions or whatever level he did, it was a pattern of predatory behavior. Whether or not he did anything that would warrant a violation of the penal code, we don't know that for sure. He hasn't been charged with any kind of criminal complaint that we know of, at, or at this point. He's, he's dealing with a civil suit, which is going to hurt his pocketbook in the end like a, like it did OJ. OJ got acquitted in the legal, in the criminal court, but he went broke, bankrupt from the, the civil court, finding that the preponderance of evidence that he was responsible for those two deaths. It's like Deshaun Watson's going to pay for this monetarily, whether it's not, it's not going to be from his 11 game suspension off a $1 million contract. That wasn't enough. His consequence is really just going to be, oh, how long until we see the real Deshaun Watson on the field? Like, he's going to have to answer questions about, why aren't you playing well? Those are the only consequences he's going to really feel from this whole ordeal. I think that's that's just shit. Yeah. I wish there was a better pivot out of a topic like this. <laughs> uh, there's not. Hey, so soapboxes <laughs> are fun, though. They are, and that's why we do this at the beginning of every show. And also, you know, like l listeners, viewers, I mean, obviously, like, you know, my it, awkwardness in transitioning to the next part of the podcast is definitely not any indication of how I feel about this topic. It's just that there's really no way to do it better than what I'm doing right now. So we will move on <laughs> to, okay, we will move on to before we do the thing for this week, we have to talk about the things from last week. And that is why Nick Lateral, the fastest recapper in all of fantasy football podcasting will tell us what happened with the things that we discussed last week. All right. Well, last week we had two topics for Herms. It was the way too early 2023 redraft mock draft. We did two rounds with 12 teams and Justin Jefferson was our consensus 101, which I think is really the biggest takeaway. Uh, we didn't even have a running back come off the board, I believe, until 104. Um, and then we also covered Damian Pierce versus Dante Foreman. Rest of season did a bit of a deep dive into that. I picked Foreman overall, but said Pierce would do well in week 13. And maybe it's the better play in week 17 that we'll see if Foreman can just absolutely ball out as the rest of the season goes on. If he does, I think he's actually got about an equal shot, which Herms and I discussed. But for now, going with Pierce in week 17, Foreman overall. Uh, and Pierce was solid last week against the Browns in week 13, despite, you know, not getting in the end zone quite. You know, I think he or did he manage to get in the end zone? can't remember i don't remember yep i think he had 57 I, yards on uh, and no touchdowns yeah That's so i was gonna say he like did okay with the yards Foreman, definitely bounced Foreman back 100 yards definitely a bounce back from uh his previous two performances where he averaged eight yards a game so not great but improving <laughs> That's there it. We go. all we got i like that i like Foreman rest of season as well yeah. There you go. See, and now we have additional input. There we go. The That's fastest good because they're my two RB twos in one league. That is true. So there we go. The fastest minute in fantasy football recapping brought to you by Thrive Fantasy. If you would like to play Thrive Fantasy and you like to do uh, DFS, but uh, but uh, not. Yeah, but not because prop bets are more fun. You can sign up using promo code HERMS for a 100% match on your first deposit up to 100 doll hairs. So we're talking if you put down $20, boom, you get $40. If you put down like, I don't know, like $33, it's like, boom, $66. I mean, like, so you understand how that works. Man. Promo code HERMS on Thrive Fantasy if you sign up today. Or, well, I guess it doesn't have to be today, but what, not the point. There we go. That's the do thing. It now. Yeah, I, do it right now. Don't even pause the show. Just like literally do it now while I'm saying this. We'll kill we have enough the technology. Time. Exactly. Come on, <laughs> come on, folks. But yeah, so we got that out of the way. And now we get into the main part of the show for which we have no title. I, we, the show. That's what it's called. So we teased a little bit before. Kind of already talked a little bit about Brock Purdy, but he is in the news because one handsome James Garoppolo. Uh, unfortunate situation with his foot that will cause him to miss the rest of the regular season. I will let you pick it up from there. McLateral, resident Niners fan, what would you like to discuss surrounding this San Francisco 49ers franchise? Yes, unfortunately, uh, during the game against the Miami Dolphins, Jimmy Jesus, Jimothy Garoppolo, our Lord and Savior, he, um, he, he broke his foot. Um 
Now, it turns out he's not going to need surgery. And so if Brock Purdy can just somehow get us to like the NFC championship, we may get Garoppolo back and actually have a shot. Um, But I'm not holding my breath. And so then Brock Purdy came in, Mr. Irrelevant, took over for the Niners offense and was surprisingly adequate, I think is the correct way to describe it. Like <laughs> that was my actually, bar, the bar was so low, but he hopped right over it. <laughs> like I expected it to be bad and it wasn't bad. It was uninspiring. It is definitely something that if a defense has time to game plan for next week could be an issue because well, Mike McDaniel is familiar, of course, with the Shanahan system, given that he is part of that coaching tree. He didn't game plan for a quarterback that can't throw the ball more than six yards. But future teams may actually be able to go, okay, you know what? If we just like shut them down, they're going to just have to run it on us. And maybe we can live with that. And I think we'd be in real trouble if it wasn't for the defense, but the defense like might be just enough for us to actually win football games. But here's the thing. We're here to talk about fantasy. And so my question to the panel here, can you play any San Francisco 49ers going forward with Jimmy Garoppolo out? Because he is not coming back for your fantasy season. He may come back for the Niners season, but he will not be back at all during the regular season. It, there's literally no way. So my theory is that Christian McCaffrey is a yes. You know, between his athleticism, his dynamism, the usage he gets in that offense, and the fact that he will now have a quarterback even more willing to dump off to him than ever before, he's probably going to be pretty safe. Because oh, yeah. we've already seen him on bad offenses with poor quarterback play and have him be fine. His whole career. <laughs> Yeah, so not too worried about him. But I think anyone else is genuinely up for discussion. So I guess I want to start with Brock Purdy. Can you play Brock Purdy at all in fantasy? Because he actually, <laughs> that is a fair point, but let me let me just get this in here. Brock, Brock Purdy actually scored 15.3 fantasy points according to Fantasy Pro's. I think an RESPN league that you and I are in our home league terms, it was something like 14 and change, yeah. which is like not amazing, but considering you didn't play the full game first start, Miami's not a terrible defense. Like that is on paper, surprisingly good now. So I put it to you guys, are we going to get more like on paper, surprisingly good performances? Because to me, I see a lot of similarities with him and his usage to another San Francisco offshoot type of a team, the New York Jets and Mike White. Again, Mike White may very well be an actual better quarterback than Brock Purdy. And I think if you think that that is fair, but the way that they are utilized in their respective offenses because of their limitations is very similar. Now, Mike White, oddly enough, this year, 7.4 intended air yards per pass attempt, which is surprising, but yeah. last year, 5.9. So right in the Purdy zone, as I'm calling it. The Purdy we saw zone. Bryce Perkins, the Bryce Perkins, uh, 5.8 intended air yards per pass attempt, and Brock Purdy 6.3 this year. So again, I think there's a lot of similarities there. So my question to you guys first is: Brock Purdy, any likelihood of fantasy relevance? My vote is no, but I want to just get your guys' thoughts on the matter, and then we'll continue to go down the offense. I'll defer to our guest. So we have to consider Brock Purdy as a streaming option before we can unbuckle this here. Uh, when you're looking at the quarterback landscape below 50% roster ship, um, Brock Purdy is obviously very low on the spectrum. Very Probably little close to zero. Right. I, mean, I think it was 4% when I looked last. And that's up 4% from last week, of course. Uh, it's, it's, you have to consider him uh, an option for a, your super flex QB2, especially if you had Jimmy Garoppolo in that spot. Or if you had, um, if you had another injury, like you, there's a couple injuries that popped up this week 
where Brock Purdy might be your only option at quarterback off the waiver wire tonight. The problem is, can you expect any kind of fantasy output from a guy who is averaging six yards per pass play? Like he's when he's dropping back, he's dumping it off every single time. And they don't want him to attempt passes farther down the field because his, like I said before, his release time could be measured on a sundial. He doesn't have the arm strength or the arm talent or the timing to throw boundary passes or downfield passes. Once you get a little bit of tape on this guy, you're, we're going to see he's riddled with limitations as an NFL passer. As far as McCaffrey goes, I completely agree because not only do, is he so great that everybody should bow down to his talent, but the next the next four games that encompass the rest of our fantasy season, Buccaneers give up a fair amount of yards to running backs from the backfield. The Seahawks give up one, among the most point fantasy points to running backs. The Commanders, same thing, receiving yards to running backs. They, they're tough against the run, but they give up a lot of outlet passes to running backs. And the Raiders can't stop anybody. Those are four very appealing matchups for running backs in the, for the rest of our season. Is Brock Purdy going to be relevant in any of those games? No. I would say that his ceiling is the 15 points that he put up in Every series but the first one would when, when Jimmy Garoppolo broke his foot on the first series of the game. So it was pretty much a full game. It's true. And he had two easy touchdowns on drives where they ran the ball right into the teeth of what well, I think it's a 29th ranked defense in the NFL in Miami. So yeah, the rest of these defenses, other than Seattle and the I, I the Raiders in Seattle still grayed out better than the Dolphins, but that's more of like game flow type things. So, no, I don't think Brock Purdy's going to even eclipse double digits the rest of the season. Yeah. I mean, like, my my biggest thing, just because, I mean, like, a lot of what has to be said has already been said, but, like, the only reason this is super relevant is because of super flex <laughs> leagues. Because we've talked on this show this season about the fact that if you decided to invest in a quarterback who is any younger than me, then you are up a creek without a paddle this year. You just are. It sucks, but it's true. It's very much a youth movement in the NFL right now, but also in fantasy at the quarterback position, something that we were not particularly prepared for at the outset. So we've had to adjust on the fly and trust weird quarterbacks that we weren't super stoked about before, which is why like in our waiver column, like I've been like, you know what? <laughs> let's right. go taylor heineke sure i was gonna say you know? the same thing <laughs> like, exactly. i hate taylor heineke i can't i can't even watch him i said he is the making sausage of co the quarterback position it's like you don't want to watch him play because you'll throw up but at the end of the day he's got 15 16 fantasy points you're like damn it taylor thank you that was that was solid yeah dude <laughs> and like and the other part of it is you know like you were saying before you know uh it's like, was it good against, like, Miami, all things considered? Like, sure. But, like, can we expect he will necessarily do that again? No. But, like, the surprising output that we got from him is basically the Kenny Pickett special, who is also probably going to be available, who at least, you know, like, you know. On the ascent. A hundred percent. I firmly believe it. I but I, I I can't talk about that every show because I was told from the producers it's I have to only I have to space it out once every three weeks that I talk about Kenny Pickett. But like you know and like like no is the cast of characters in Pittsburgh better? No, but you know Pickett has the familiarity of he's been in the offense for much longer and has more you know rapport built. So my point being is like sure you're going to have to pivot to younger uncomfortable options, but even then you can still probably do better than Brock Purdy for as ugly as it is. Well, so then let me give you two of those options here. You've got Brock Purdy up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You got Mike White up against the Buffalo Bills. And you got Bryce Perkins. Let's say he is the starter for Los Angeles this week, which we're not sure he will be, but let's for the hypothetical say that he is. Sure. Up against the Las Vegas Raiders. Which of those three quarterbacks are you playing? Tyler Huntley. <laughs> yes. Not an option. 
<laughs> not an option. He's, a, he's definitely an option. He is a, definitely an option. Yeah. And if I'm looking at a, an injury replacement quarterback, I'm looking at this list. It's the guys you mentioned plus Tyler Huntley. I'd re- much rather play Huntley. But I feel he's, like most everyone would rather play Huntley. I mean, he'll be a top waiver priority. Probably the right. top for the quarterback position for sure. I can see that, yeah. And then you have guys like Ryan Tannehill who's just laying in the weeds for free, 25% roster chip in every league. And you're like, okay, why are we not playing a guy or picking up a guy who's got a favorable schedule and has been a QB1 the last two years in a row? Well, actually, like, what, if you what, read the heat check this past weekend over a fantasy six-pack, I would have told you that you should pick up Ryan Tannehill and that you should not have played him this weekend against the Philadelphia Eagles. Incredibly tough right. defense. And right. if you listen to that, you will have Tannehill available to play the rest of the season and probably be pretty good and have avoided his poor performance last week. I'm glad you and I are on the same page here because uh, unless you're in the deepest league imaginable and Brock Purdy is the only guy available, I'd still probably play a position player in the Superflex over him. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just well, I think that's fair enough. So let's move on to one of those position players. Then you talked about how good the running back matchups are. Jordan Mason, does he have any value now with Brock Purdy under center, possibly as a flex or a zero RB RB two? Absolutely. Herms, over to you. Yes, he does. Because here's the thing, man. Like, look, dude, and shout out the homie Jeff Bell over there, football guys for whom J Bell tolls. He had me hip with the Jordan Mason drum beat from camp, you know, like they love that kid, you know? And so I went back and I looked at a lot of what he did at Georgia tech. And like, with that being, you know, like around your neck of the woods at this point, you know, so you, you know what that offense is it's ground and pound. That's what they do. You know? So like, you have to be like a pretty, you know, built type of running back to be able to, you know, withstand being in that type of system anyway. And he just showed like he can barrel through dudes and do all of that. And serving as that archetype in like in a harmonious fashion with a Christian McCaffrey, especially with how they're going to have to augment that offense to try to keep McCaffrey even more, you know, like they're obviously trying to keep him healthier or whatever, but this is a guy like Last time we had Bo on the program, we were talking about the Christian McCaffrey injury stuff. So it's just like weird how that kind of tied in. But like, you know, it's it behooves them to lighten as much of the workload for McCaffrey as possible while still having him involved. And to maximize his skill set, you do want to lean on a back like Jordan Mason. So just even, purely from a schematical standpoint of like the things that they're going to want to accomplish, he fits so well with what's going to work for a Brock Purdy led offense that he has to be on your bench at minimum. I love how the 49ers for two consecutive years have picked up two rookie running backs and the later rookie running back has been the better and higher, higher rate of prospect on my list. And for two consecutive years, those results have, have borne out the same way. It's like we had, I had Elijah Mitchell way ahead of Trey Sermon last year. I laughed in their face when they traded up to get Trey Sermon because I knew he was a turd, couldn't play football, didn't want to play football. He just got he got lucked into playing time at Ohio State. Then you have this year where you have Jordan Mason going in there with TDP. Tyron Davis Price on tape was awful. I couldn't stand to watch that guy play at LSU. When they picked him, with a, they used draft capital on that guy. And then they go and get Jordan Mason way after the draft and said, hey, if you play special teams well, TDP doesn't play special teams. Jordan Mason's a special teams ace. Like, he was outstanding on special teams. He was their rock on special teams as a fir- like fresh, undrafted rookie, nose to the ground, lunch pail guy. Kyle Shanahan loves those guys. The guys that are like, hey, whatever you need me to do, coach, I'm out there. I'm bashing skulls from day one. And guess what? When TDP goes down and all these other backs go down, because that's what happens in San Francisco every year. It's like, guess what? We put this kid in and well, he's a damn good ball carrier too. Holy crap. I had no idea. TDP irrelevant. Imagine that. And just like a a quick note, because I mentioned it like earlier in the season, but just to remind viewers and listeners, like there is a quote like from the coaching staff, ahead of the regular season when it came down to the roster cuts and all that about the motivation behind moving on from Trey Sermon, the one name that was explicitly mentioned was Jordan Mason. 
I rest my case. <laughs> Does Trey Sermon play special teams? No. Does Tyron Davis Price play special teams? No. Does Jordan Bas- J- Jordan Mason play special teams? Yes, and he's the best guy we got on special teams. He's not going anywhere. Bingo. Is so, he, he going to run the ball over Jeff Wilson early in the season? No, Jeff Wilson's a better pro, as at least more established in the system. And then Christian McCaffrey comes later, and you're like, okay, well, we have Elijah Mitchell. Well, Elijah Mitchell's hurt, and now you got Jordan Mason back in the fray. And he's showing out. He looks great out there. He's bruising guys. So he does. But for all that is, so I, I think all the points you guys made are great. Flex play, yes. I'm playing Jordan Mason in a lot of my flex leagues. I think it depends on the depth of your league. Because for as good as he was against a weak run defense, he had exactly 5.1 fantasy points. Yeah. And like that's no receiving yards. Yeah, no zero receiving, receiving yards. yards zero McCaffrey targets. Was all the zero receiving rece- out of the- yeah. And there's no way they're going to go away from McCaffrey. And no. they have Kyle Juszczyk if they do want to go away from McCaffrey. They will have no desire to go Juszczyk. with Jordan Mason. Jordan Mason's not going to complain about that because he's like, I know my role in this offense. I know my role in this team. It's not catching a ball out of the backfield. And that's okay. So – there's going to so be he's no Brian injury. Robinson, but I think he's better than Brian Robinson, honestly. Interesting. You know, I, he certainly looked great this past week. I think he will be an integral part of this team's NFL offense. But I think for fantasy, unless you're in it's a tough. deep league or maybe making a DFS play where you're trying to like yeah. game the system a bit, I think it's going to be tough to get the necessary production out. I, I appreciate that because I'm speaking on the fa- on behalf of my few uh, of my 36 leagues that have three flex starters, and so if I have three flex starters, yeah, he's definitely you could probably play top. Jordan Mason because if he scores a touchdown, I'm looking at double digits from a guy who would would otherwise give me a zero. Like last week, my 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 third flex starter was Chiga Conquo. Thank goodness he got he finally got the run <laughs> over. Yeah. Yeah. Thank good my my turp my turp homie uh, Chiga Conquo got uh, more snaps and routes run than Austin Hooper for the first time this year. And there's a changing in the guard on a foot here uh, in Tennessee. That's what I was waiting for. And that's what I was hoping for last week. And now it's really happening. I'm excited because I, I can make a playoff run. If Chica Conk was my third flex starter. Spoiler alert. This is not the last time we're talking about him. This show. Love to see I it. love that. Love to see it. Okay. So general consensus seems to be we're all pretty pro Jordan Mason. It's just a matter of what your needs are because of the production he's going to put out. Expectations can't be that high. God, great. Love it. Moving on. I initially had the wide receivers here, but we're going to save them for the end. So let's talk tight end. Let's talk George Kittle, an elite tight end to say the least. But the issue is he's elite at every facet of playing tight end. And the Niners know that and they use him accordingly. And he seemed to bear the brunt of the Brock Purdy shift this past weekend because he ended up with two receptions for 22 yards on just three targets. Not great, to say the least, especially considering one of those was a 19-yard reception. So he had a 19-yard reception, a three-yard reception. Not what you're hoping from your elite tight end. What do we feel about George Kittle going forward? Is he playable is he a guy where you're just like the ceiling? So I you have to play him. What are our thoughts? Who wants the floor? Bo, you're up. George Kittle needs to forget how to block. That's what needs to happen. It's he never going to happen. Forget how to do it. And I know he's a football player first, and it's a team game, and he's the best player they have on offense at every facet. What they need from him is not what we need from him. What the 49ers need from him is to be a third offensive tackle for Brock Purdy. And you can throw out the narrative, hey, every rookie quarterback's best friend is his security blanket. Well, that's not George Kittle. That's obviously Christian McCaffrey. And so it's it's not good for us. It's not good for us at all because if you drafted George Kittle, you're drafting him as a top five tight end. And it's just not how it works with the 49ers offensive scheme, especially with the third string quarterback now in the game. And to put that in perspective here, to add to Bo's point, I've got the snap counts up. You got four guys with a hundred percent snap share, all on the O line. Yep. Then you got two guys with ninety six percent snap share. One's Trent Williams, the other is George Kittle. 
despite being on the field for 96% of the offensive route snaps, he got bad. three targets. And his route participation was in the 60 percentile, which is not what we're looking for with tight ends. I know that from nope. uh, my horrible experience with Kyle Pitts this year is just because they're on the field does not mean they're running routes. And just because they're running routes does not mean they're getting targets because some of these coaches, they feel like their best chance to win is by outsmarting their opponent instead of just playing the best players in the right position. Well, Herm's anything to add here. To pick up the baton about, you know, that kind of points about how, you know, their coaches are going to use them in the way that they're going to use them for the real life team, not necessarily what we really want out of it. I'm not going to go over every single outcome here, but what I am going to point out, I got his game log pulled up, PPR scoring. Now, also, just caveat, I understand that George Kittle missed a little bit of time, as he occasionally does, just because of the type of player he is, blah, blah, blah. So even with that understood, you know, like, type of duty is. He has one, two, three, four, five, six games under double digits. The highest of those, mind you, is a 7.7 point effort in week five against Carolina. Now, the boom weeks where you love them, you know, like three weeks in a row, six through eight, we're talking 16.3, 21.8, 12.9. You know, you love to see it, folks. You love to see it. Really huge game against Arizona. Like that was sick, right? But what I'm pointing out is that even with Jimmy Garoppolo, They've built an offense that does not necessarily need to feature him. And I really think, you know, and this is no indictment on George Kittle whatsoever, but like we take his real life prowess and, you know, just assign a fantasy value to it that I think was more consistently true in the past than it currently is. And I think even beyond just this... It was true when our second best wide receiver was Trent Taylor as opposed to Brandon Ayuk. Yeah. So it's like this conversation, like, you know, obviously we don't have the time to expand upon this, but I mention it just because it's like, I think the whole George Kittle conundrum expands beyond the Brock Purdy rest of season of it all. I, I would think, agree. I think it's an interesting conversation that dynasty managers have yes. to have. So like, again kind of answered the question, but took it in a way that highlights something a little bit more scarier than regardless of who the quarterback is. So, well, like, so then let me put it this way to you guys. A real quick sure. answer on this. I'll start with you, Herms, then we'll go to you, Bo. George Kittle, are you starting him or are you looking for a streaming option? Do you have some streaming options that, depending on the name, I would give the green light to. Okay, Bo, you don't even have to name the player unless you got a guy ready off the top of your mind. But are you playing George Kittle or are you finding a streaming option? I am a traditionalist and I'm playing George Kittle because I have to. I, f okay. I have to. If I spent that draft capital on him and he has the highest ceiling, I'm a ceiling player. I'm a ceiling drafter. I'm drafting and playing and starting George Kittle because of his ceiling, knowing that the rest of the position is just as volatile, if not more, then even when George Kittle plays his worst and gets five points, That's fair. is I mean, ten points for Chigakonkwa was was tight end ten, I believe. That's that's horrible. Like the, the scoring is so depressed at the position that you can't help but hope for a ceiling performance from George Kittle. You have to start him because he's your ticket to that that game breaking week that can give you a win. And I think both points are completely valid. I'm inclined to agree with bow just because of what likely is available out there but herms has a fair point and if you really are trying to play the matchups i don't blame you there are also guys out there like greg dulcich uh who gets tons of target share but is on such a bad offense that it rarely results to touchdowns and while i think searching for a touchdown dependent tight end can be a slippery slope when your tight end's not getting any touchdowns that is an equal problem um so I definitely get where both you guys are coming from. I think that's fantastic analysis. Let's see, though, what you guys got for the kickers, because we're talking about Robbie Gould here. The that's best fantasy performer outside of the defense, depending on your scoring for the San Francisco 49ers this week, was Robbie Gould with 18 points. Counting them, racks on racks on racks. 
you love to see it was 39th overall in PPR scoring, according to fantasy pros. So my question for you and whoever wants it first can take it. Can you start without hesitation, Robbie Gould, the rest of the season? Because I think the answer is yes. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kicker, kicker is such a random crapshoot that if you have a guy who's on an offense that's in scoring position quite often, it, like independent of quarterback play, they're in scoring position quite often because the system they run puts them in that position quite often through the running game. Uh, yeah. And it's a conservative game. Like Shanahan is who he is, and he's one of the most conservative coaches in the NFL. So he's not going to push the envelope and go for a bunch of fourth downs when he knows his kicker is almost automatic and his defense is spectacular. So this yep. is it allows a coach like Shanahan to be conservative because he knows he can win games by shutting people down and putting points on the board, whether it's through the end zone or, or through the uprights. That's that's why Robbie Gold is a must-start kicker. If you have him, you start him every week because he's as steady as it gets. I mean, you can't really bet on kickers, but betting on a 49ers kicker, that's that's pretty solid. Yep, age has shown a little for him this year, but I would agree with both of you on that. I think he is a start as well. So let's get into the fun stuff. Let's get into the wide receivers. So Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk, both not the greatest weeks. I mean, Debo Samuel, 12.3 PPR points. Like that could be worse. You're hoping for a little bit more, but like that's double digits, right? Not too shabby. Brandon Ayuk, 9.6, little lower, but there are some glimmers of hope if you like the targets because Debo Samuel, 10 targets, Brandon Ayuk, nine targets. That is the volume you like to see from those guys, but it's Brock Purdy volume. It's not Jimmy Garoppolo volume. So my question to you and whoever wants to take it first can Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk. Are you trusting them or are you potentially looking for other options? And are you kind of viewing them the same, or is there now one wide receiver that stands out more than the other for you? Herms, oh. you oh. seem to have like got something in your mind on that okay. last bit there, so let's roll with it. Yeah, because uh, so you you had me up to. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. But then the the thing you kind of posited there at the end, the whole uh, do you view one differently than the other? I think there is a pretty f distinct difference between the two of them in the with what they may have to shift the philosophy to like does everybody remember how much fun we had with Debo Samuel last year because how he was used in this wacky gadgety way with an inexperienced player like that they may have to go back to that so like how I will rank them each week is going to be relatively close together, at least at first, because I'm going to give it a week before I get like hella confident in anything that, you know, I do as far as that process goes. But like, Ayuk is, it, regardless of quarterback, is kind of at the mercy of like hoping that the game plan says, hey, we're going to lock on to you this week and really, you know, do the thing. Whereas Debo can operate and do so many different things that like he doesn't even have to be the focal point to contribute like he can be like hey we'll scheme up some fun touches for you and he'll just make the most out of his opportunity even if it is smaller by comparison because of the type of player that he is his ability to you know create his own opportunity in open space is so great as compared to an Ayuk. if they do kind of go back to what worked for them and specifically him last year with Purdy under center, not only is that I think going to serve them well, but could also negate the things we said before about Jordan Mason potentially, which is something that I failed to mention as a possibility because I knew we were going to get to the receiver thing later. Like another caveat on top of the Jordan Mason argument is the fact that, well, with everything being as bad as it is down to your third string, Mr. Irrelevant, they may have to throw everything, including the kitchen sink at these defenses to keep this thing rolling. And the big sink that you can throw at a defense is Debo Samuel out of a backfield. They're not doing that with Brandon Ayuk. They're just not. So like, I don't feel 
at this moment in terms of, like I said, where I'm going to rank these guys this week, like, I don't know, but Debo's going to be higher. And if I'm going to plant my flag, you know, on who I think will be more relevant, it will definitely be Debo for all of those reasons. All right, Bo, what do you got to add? I love the analysis from Herms there. You agreeing? You disagreeing? Is there some nuance? What you got? Um, what I saw from that game was uh, more of an emphasis on Debo Samuel's short game that we haven't seen from Jimmy Garoppolo. Uh, it's been more of the mid-range game that Debo is is a little bit less good at. Uh, Debo is not your downfield type receiver like Ayuk is. So Ayuk was unlocked by Jimmy Garoppolo because in that system, they allow Jimmy Garoppolo, if it's in the middle of the field, not on the boundaries, they allow Jimmy Garoppolo to push the ball down the field. And Ayuk is an extremely good route runner at, at middle and, and longer distance. Debo Samuel is not that type of receiver. Debo Samuel is a yak receiver. And so what we've seen is those low A dot targets for Debo come back under Brock Purdy and gave him more opportunities to break off long runs. He didn't break off any longer ones, but add into the fact that he's a good running back. That's he's the preference now going forward over Ayuk. Okay. So then my question to both you and Herms will go to you first and then Bo Herms for Debo. Are you starting him no matter what? Is he finding a way into your lineup somehow, regardless of what slot he goes into? You probably have to just because it's like, a little weird that I'm saying this now, considering what I just said about the Kittle thing, <laughs> but it's a little bit of a different thing in my mind anyway. Like, I understand the logic otherwise, but I digress. Like, for as disappointing as Debo has been relative to, like, what he was last year, and I think his ADP was a little bit weird and uncomfortable at the beginning of the season, and we tried to tell people about that. We did. But, like, for all of the reasons that we mentioned, it's – he is the likeliest beneficiary of a guy that noodles it a few yards out and that's it. So like 10 you, targets and four rushing attempts compared to nine targets and zero rushing attempts for Ayuk. I mean, in yeah. just the raw numbers, I know that like targets and attempts don't speak to everything, but yeah, I think the point you're making. So, okay. So Debo's likely making it. In. What about Ayuk? I've got to be in one of those leagues Bo was talking about earlier. If you're starting three wide receivers, if you have multiple flex spots, I'd give it this week because he looked okay dishing it to him last week. But if it does not pay dividends this week, then I would probably stash, stash him on the bench. But then also, just quick note, if you're fighting for a spot really bad right now and you're in one of those types of leagues, that is where I could understand shit, I really need to win this matchup to get into the playoffs. So let's be a little conservative. Fine. Like for the people that have already sealed their fate, do what you like. But if you're fighting for it right now, I think the best thing to do would be to conservatively bench Ayuk for the time being until we see more. Okay. Bo, over to you. First, the Debo question. Is Debo making it <coughs> into your lineup somehow? Absolutely. No matter Absolutely. Absolutely. He is a starter. He's okay. a starter. I, I agree with all that, by the way. I think that while Debo's production, it's not necessarily going to be pretty because of the volume. You do just have to throw him in there. The talent. He's a well. special player. You spent a, an early round pick on him and he's getting an upgrade with this, with this quarterback change. So I'm, I'm starting him automatically. Love it. All right. <clears throat> Ayuk, is he making it into your lineup no matter what, or are there caveats here or is he out? He's still in, but he is not in the same position. So where he was my wide receiver two or three on a certain team, he's now a flex play. Uh, so you're expecting 9, 10, 12 points out of him, but you don't see that 20-point ceiling from him anymore uh, with no Jimmy Garoppolo throwing him the ball down the field. So yep. uh, he's still a starter, but not the same kind of starter, and it's a little disappointing, but we can still get use out of the guy. Yeah, so I, I, I tend to agree with that. I would say that for me personally, like I need to be having like two flex spots or three wide receiver spots probably. Uh, the other thing that concerns me is there's not a massive difference, but Ayuk is more of a contested catch guy between the two. And Brock Purdy is not throwing contested catches up no. there. So like that further diminishes beyond the downfield threat what Ayuk can do. All right, here's where it's going to get fun. I got two wide receivers for you here. 
both who last week saw similar targets to the two guys we just talked about. In fact, one of them has been seeing similar targets to them for weeks now. And they're both pretty widely available on waivers. The most rostered one of the two is at 29% in Yahoo leagues. That's it. Would you rather be playing either of the Niners wide receivers or Nico Collins? Herms to you. Debo, Collins, Ayuk. Bo to you. Same. Collins' volume has turned into not much actual uh, reception. Like he had 10 targets, three for 35. Luckily scored a touchdown at the end of the game to salvage the week. But uh, he's out targeting Brandon Cooks every single week. And that's that's their you know. ex, oh. he's that's the X receiver. Like Cooks yeah. was already already the Z. But he was getting more targets, and now it, the X has trans. He has he has progressed to the to be the Alpha X. X going give it to you, and it's still not pretty because Ayuk is the Niners X, but unfortunately the quarterback isn't capable of targeting the X like they need to. So um, it's Brandon, it's Kyle Allen versus Brock Purdy in a battle of the worst shitstorm <laughs> X receiver you could oh. possibly imagine. <laughs> So I would say it's a tie between Ayuk I- and Collins, but I think I lean Collins because he is getting the volume to back it up, and his catch rate can't stay at thirty percent. It just can't, right? Yeah. So for tell that me, reason, only I'm crazy. No. So for that reason, for me, I'm with Herms, where it's a pretty obvious Samuel Collins Ayuk. I think it comes down to. But I used to be volume, in the red zone more often than the Texans. Collins' though, volume, is, though, isn't going to change. Collins' yeah. usage isn't going to change. He may maximize that usage better, but he's clearly the lead receiver in this offense. And barring Kyle Allen going down, in which case, in theory, Davis Mills would come back and probably do the same thing. You know, So we're not too worried there. No. It's going to be the same. Whereas Brendan Ayuk could fall off the face of the earth next week, and it wouldn't be the biggest shock in the world. It would be like a little surprising, sure, but you could go, well, yeah, I mean, the guy can barely get the ball six yards down the field. Like, yeah, okay, you can't really take advantage of your downfield extra. Like, it all makes sense, and for that reason, I think I do have to have Collins ahead of Ayuk. This next one, though, I think it's a little more interesting because I think we've come to the consensus that this quarterback is definitely better than Brock Purdy. And so that is, would you rather have the Niners wide receivers or Corey Davis, who is widely available in leagues, Herms, to you. Debo, Corey <laughs> Davis, Ayuk. And before I get yelled at, I mentioned this on the waiver wire pod that I recorded last night that published today. So I guess two days ago by the time that you're hearing this, although waivers already ran. So what's the whatever, whatever. Corey Davis might still be out there by the time you hear it. So, huh, it just could be valuable. Look at the splits. Last year, even this year. Corey Davis is great. Well, not great. Very good when <sighs> Zach Wilson's not the quarterback. Those first four weeks of the season, if I remember correctly off the top of my dome, wide receiver 26 and PPR in that first month. So, like, bro. Check, checks out. He had a wide receiver. Uh, check him a notes good, real quick. Wide receiver 28 week one. Wide receiver 21 week two. Wide receiver 15 week four. So, you know, wide receiver 26 would definitely check out. Yeah, bro, and, like, immediately walking in. I mean, like, he had played the last couple games, like, slowly acclimating back. But this was, like, his first, like, big game back, quote-unquote, especially, you know, seeing the field and shit. Ten targets. Immediately walks in, gets ten targets. Like, look, unless Zach Wilson finds the field again, in which case I will vomit, like... I don't think it's happening. Yeah, so, like, you know, again, like, I can hear viewers and listeners being like, Herbs, what what are you talking about? It's like, look, it's true. Check the numbers. When Corey Davis is playing without Zach Wilson, he's actually pretty damn good. <laughs> so, like, as right, is so. every single Jets offensive player. <laughs> also, that. So, yeah. so real quick, Kerms, one more cur- last curveball to you here. Debo Nico Davis Ayuk or Debo Davis Nico Ayuk? The latter. Okay. So you got Corey Davis ahead of Nico Collins. I have never fully recovered from being a Corey Davis truther. There you go. I'm right. reformed, but I'm not fully recovered. <laughs> go over to you here. First, Niners wide receivers or Corey Davis? Uh, 
everybody above Corey Davis. I think last week was a fluke. Ooh, spicy. They don't call you the king of the heat for nothing. Yeah, so um, Elijah Moore is the reason. Elijah Moore is increasing his, <laughs> yeah, increasing the workload every week since since Mike White took over. Uh, Elijah Moore went from doghouse to wanting a trade to oh Zach Wilson's up, Mike White's in. Hey, I'm a I'm gonna be a big fan of this. Didn't get very many snaps, but three turned three targets into two big catches and a touchdown. Then he got up to a 68 percent route share last week and didn't put up the numbers per se. Corey Davis got those numbers, but we saw that trust. We saw that trust, and Corey Davis is nowhere near the talent that Elijah Moore is. Is he a wily vet that's going to put himself in good positions? Yeah. I just trust Elijah Moore to put up the bigger numbers down the stretch that we want to see over Corey Davis. I think the 10 target thing, we only turned, he only caught five of those balls, and luckily a couple of them went for good big plays that really made it look stand out. So 13 points to Corey Davis. Round of applause. We might not see it the rest of the season. I like to I like to follow patterns and the pattern of growth that I've seen from the uber talented Elijah Moore out of the slot. That's what I'm going to be banking on. So uh, no, I will not be doing the Corey Davis dance this year. All right. For the record, I have it. Debo Collins, then probably just ahead. IU than Davis. <clears throat> I, I think Herms that. makes some great points. I he's think a truther. He's, he's a wide he's receiver. Recovering. I, Corey <laughs> Davis is a great option out there on waivers. But for me, the issue is just roll in the offense expectation. Corey Davis could ultimately become the third wide receiver in his team. Now, he could remain the second, which is very, very entirely possible because – as Bo mentions, the talent certainly favors Elijah Moore, but the way they scheme that offense currently, it does favor Corey Davis. He is the one that stays on the field more often. So I see both sides of it for me. I think I'm leaning on you just because I think his target floor is a little safer. Even in some of those better games that Davis had in the beginning of the year, the targets were like a little lower than we'd like it compared to what Ayuk has really like earned in this Niners, I don't offense. expect the Jets to throw the ball 57 times a game anymore either. That was, you know, they've game. done it with Joe Flacco. They've done it with Mike that White. Was... Maybe this is who they really want to be. Well, at the same time, that's it was a pass funnel defense. The the Vikings yeah. stopped the run. They can't stop the pass. So you were going to see that, especially when that they were trailing the whole game too. So it was no. Like it would it were... would definitely be surprising to see quite that passing volume, even if they do right. pass more without Zach Wilson. It would be a little surprising to see 50 plus attempts be a regular right. thing. Yes. Uh, I, all I, right. I have a feeling that they're going to try to get their running backs more involved going forward, especially with how things have gone with their team. Well, Herms, that's all I've got. Back over to you. There we go. Now we can transition to the second part of the episode. Although, well, based on the runtime, I think maybe we could cut this up into multiple episodes. Maybe I'll just have to do some, you know, editing afterward. I don't know. But we have, like, I, I'm comfortable with it because there's a lot of good information and still more to come. Because, as the guest, I have, you know, pawned off responsibility of coming up with a topic myself because that is the type of person that I like to be. Bo brought to the table a very interesting, very on-brand lateral show topic to talk about this week because... Look, we kind of foreshadowed it like a little bit earlier talking about some of these tight ends, how weird and gross it is. People are clamoring for like marginally better than horrible out there in these fantasy football streets. <laughs> Bo, why don't you go ahead and introduce your topic talking about these like pretty good, not good, but kind of maybe, I don't know. No, no, uh, none of them are good. None of them are good. <laughs> but... In the wasteland that is the tight end position that this season, especially last week, has brought upon a new fervor for uh, going with a tight end slash wide receiver flex spot going forward in leagues instead of an outright tight end position starting uh, this. It's a fever pitch right now uh, for for tight end position to just go away because you have Travis Kelsey, who's basically a wide receiver. And then you have a, a couple other guys that are relevant from week to week. And the rest of it's just like throw a pin the tail on the donkey and pray. And that's really how the position has turned out to be. But there are some guys that are getting steady volume in their offenses that 
it might not be able to trust them fully, but you can at least put them in your starting lineup and hope for some decent point flow. Uh, low expectations, of course, but tight ends that don't suck. <laughs> I just I think it's a perfect, a perfect analogy for the position where if you don't have Travis Kelsey or Mark Andrews, you are pretty much hoping for somebody who doesn't suck. It's kind of gross. And b- before we get into, you know, whatever sort of, you know, suggestions you have, whatever sort of suggestions we as a group have, I pulled this up because I thought it would be a fun talking point because you inspired me based off the topic that you suggested. It'd be fun to go over. I have the PPR scoring from this year, last year, and 2020 pulled up courtesy of fantasy data in front of me. Dear God. Okay, look. <laughs> okay. So. Now, I understand, like, we're not done with the regular season, right? So we're ahead of week 14. The fantasy season takes us through week 17 in most leagues. So if we just add whatever their average point per game is conservatively to their total right now, that's about what some of these guys are going to end up with. So just one name I want to highlight just to, like, show how bad this is. Like, Cole Komet, 8.2 points per game so let okay so 14 15 16 17 that's so times four that's 32.8 points that'll give him a total of like barely over 140 okay so this is bad this is bad this is horrible it's no good at all but that's not an unreasonable expectation to have for commit because over the past three weeks in ppr he scored 8.5 points per game so you're 8.2 pretty close to on the money yeah so it's like, you know, it, he's doing fine, but the reason I mentioned him specifically is because he is the tight end nine. It took him basically until like a month ago or five, six weeks ago to actually do shit. And this is how high this guy is. So let's say he finishes with that total that I just mentioned. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Last year, <laughs> that would have put him... Somewhere in the ballpark between Jared Cook at tight end 18 and CJ Uzama at tight end 19. So that's how bad that is by comparison of last year. Let's go back to 2020 for some more fun because (laughs) once again, that puts him somewhere in the ballpark of Tyler Higby tight end 18 and Jared Cook then of the New Orleans Saints at tight end 19. So I'm only using one example because this isn't my topic and I'm not going to take up too much time, but to illustrate to people how bad this really is, Cole Komet taking like half a season to get his shit together is going to finish this high. And when you compare it (laughs) to how bad it's already been, this is a nightmare, folks. So, Bo, pick up the baton. You're on mute. Still on mute. I'm on. There it is. Well, yeah. So <laughs> does we anybody here remember Mike Gesicki? We remember him fondly on this program. I think he gets one of the in memoriam things at the end of the episode, if you look closely. <laughs> yeah. With a really sad minor chord ballad behind it. Uh, something by Sarah McLaughlin, most likely. It's uh, in the arms of right. Angel. Yeah. All right, all right. We can only do 15 seconds before yeah. it's a demonetization thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Kosicki is tight end 24 this year, guys. The Jack Pour one spot. out. Pour one out for last year's tight end nine and the year before that tight end seven. Tight end 24 in a year where tight end scoring is an all-time low. What the hell? What the hell? Daniel Bellinger. Coming back with no eye socket in points per game, looking pretty damn good. He did have one tight end one week. All these guys have had one tight end one week. So where do you go? You go to guys who have more tight end two weeks. That's what you need to do is go and find guys who have put up multiple in in consistent, semi-consistent tight end two output you're looking at between 7 and 13 points in in more than one game. Please, for the love of God, just give me some consistency at this position. So Chiga Conquo taking over over Austin Hooper. That's where I'm looking because it's a pattern. You have to follow patterns. 
patterns of usage, increased usage. Jordan Aikens, of all players, the last couple games with Kyle Allen at the helm, is actually getting some freaking good target volume. Five targets the week before, scored a touchdown, was tied in seven. Six targets last week, but only caught three of them for 21 yards. He's got, what is that, 19 targets the last four games. And over the last three weeks, he's the tight end 11 in PPR scoring, a likely heat check candidate. Very, very likely. The guy's 30 years old. He's mostly been a blocker. But what happened to Brevin Jordan? I thought thought he was going to be the receiving tight end on that team. Breaks my heart. It does. (laughs) Kate Otten is... Kate Otten's a blocking only kind of guy, except for when Cameron Braid is out. Cameron Braid can't stay healthy. Kate Otten turns into from a blocker to a receiver. And by golly, I can work with the guy who Tom Brady found for the tight end one performance in week 13. Right? <laughs> 10 targets, six catches, 28 yards, and a touchdown was good enough for the tight end one this week. What the hell's going on here? Let that sink in, folks, because I know McLateral was at uh, was at a basketball game, so he didn't get to watch the Monday Night Football game, but we were texting, and I was telling him how much of a snooze fest it was and how much I hated watching it. But meanwhile... <laughs> the, 28 yards and a touchdown <laughs> was tight end one. It gave us the tight end one performance on the week, folks. Well, like, so I have to say, the name that we have yet to mention, at least in this section... Because I've mentioned him once before tonight. The tight end two on the week. But are you going to be getting there? Am I stealing your thunder? Because I'll let you have it back if you're about to get there. No. Throw the name out there again. It's Greg Dulcich, people. Let's go. Greg Dulcich has not one, not two. Oh, I'm in LeBron mode now. Not three, <laughs> but four. Four top 12 tight end performances in PPR scoring. Is his offense a shit show? Absolutely. Is his quarterback, Russell Wilson, to quote Sarah Palin, you betcha. But the guy got eight targets last week. He's gotten nine targets before. He regularly sees at least five. And I just feel it's tough to do better than that. Now, again, as we mentioned earlier, he's got such a bad offense that instead of having touchdown upside, he almost has touchdown downside, which is remarkable Weirdly given up. both how talented he <laughs> is and his actual like production in terms of targets and yards. Well, it's so- for uh, for often as he gets open, it just shows you how blind Russell Wilson has been this year. I, I still believe that they took and replaced Jameis Winston's, Winston's retinas with Russell Wilson. <laughs> because along the same time frame, Russell Wilson went from a nine consecutive year QB one to QB 16 last year, right around the time Jameis Winston went from a 30 pick guy to a 16 and f- a 12 and four before tearing his ACL. And now he can't get, get on the field over Andy Dalton, which is just a tra- tragedy in its own right. But Russell Wilson is awful since yeah, last year. Since the beginning of last year, he has gone from I'm guaranteed to be a QB one to I don't even know what the hell I'm doing. I can't see wide open receivers right in front of me. Drake Dulcich should have had more than eight targets in that game. And Russell Wilson did not throw it to him. He's standing there waving his arms, jumping up and down. And Russell Wilson is not going through progressions. And when he does throw it to Dulcich, it takes a miraculous effort for him to catch six out of eight targets because nothing's on target. And you expect the guy to be able to run after the catch, which is really his forte. Like he's not a special athlete at the tight end position. He's not anything spe- like I couldn't stand to watch him at UCLA. Everybody loved the guy. And I was just like, he's just a dude, but running after the catch, he's a pretty good athlete at, with the ball in his hands. Russell Wilson's not putting him in a position to score those touchdowns. So yeah, I, I'm, I love Dulcich for the volume that you can kind of hopefully guarantee yourself with, but you're, but Malcolm's right. This is, this is really rough go because you cannot expect the guy to score any touchdowns. And before you jump back in, I, I do want to ask you, uh, just generally speaking, about this philosophy of, of Bose. Instead of trying to chase the like last week's production, which I like, it, it's it's how I'm choosing to phrase it. I know that's not what he said, but that's how I'm choosing to think of it because that's what a lot of fantasy managers have done this season, and also just with tight ends in the past. 
like instead of chasing some of that shit and then just being let down and immediately falling on your face, why not just take like chase the consistent tight end to like at least it's not killing you shit. McLateral, is this actually the strategy we should probably be employing more often than not? So as much of a nightmare as tight end has been this season, I will be honest. It actually hasn't affected my fantasy performance. That well, much aren't you lucky? There we I, go. I, for most of the season, have paired like... Greg That's because Dulcich. they've let everybody down. But, but <laughs> everybody like, down I've, equally. I've, I've, I've paired Gerald Everett with Greg Dulcich and basically been fine. I've paired Dalton yeah. Schultz with Dulcich and like basically been fine. Right. Like yeah. it's kind of just worked out for me. And I get that that's not the norm. I get the norm is more like having Noah Fant have a ridiculous week and nobody having played him because of all the bad weeks he had had prior. I get all of that. But my strategy just remains targets, red zone targets. And it's kind of that for tight end and wide receiver. It's like these are the things that lead to projectable scoring. Targets, red zone targets. Because touchdowns aren't predictable, but red zone targets can be projectable. That's why Adam Thielen killed it as a wide receiver for all those years. They targeted him a ton in the red zone. Doesn't always work. None of this is perfection. But I do have to stick to my guns, I think, where it's like targets and red zone targets will steer you right more often than not. And I do just want to quickly jump in and say to your point about the tight end pairing thing, the homie Andrew Cooper at Coupe Fiasco over there at Fantasy Alarm, the tight end god. Like, yeah. if you really want to figure out how to strategically do all that shit, his work is incredible. He always talks about trying to find some of those pairings or whatever. Like, no offense to the three of us, but I didn't see a motherfucker talking about that shit until Coop did. So, like, you know, like, read his stuff about that. Like, he is, like, very dedicated to this position group in the same way that the homie Linda's out here in these kicker streets with her kicker stuff. Coupe Fiasco on Twitter. Definitely check that out for more information on that. But, like, I just I had to plug the homie because he really has put together some, like, game-changing type shit over there at Fantasy Alarm with his analysis. He's the Matt Harmon of tight ends. Honestly. Like, dude, pff, man. But yeah. Anyway, yeah, I completely agree. And uh, I've I've mostly had a lot of Kelsey teams, so that's Poo -poo. also helpful. <laughs> that <laughs> helps. Yeah, that helps. Uh, I I drafted a lot of bully tight end teams, which is great because when Kyle Pitts didn't pan out, when Darren Waller didn't pan out, when all these other guys panned out, I have plenty of teams where my first two picks were Kelsey and Andrews, and. And guess what? When I have those two, it means nobody else has shit at tight end. And that's how it works because when Andrews was hurt, I still had Kelsey putting up 30 points a week in, in the tight end spot. When they're both healthy, I have a flex play that's elite. And when one of them's on a bye, I can start the other. It, it was just too easy because I knew I could get late round value at every other position. Because when you do this enough, you have to exploit scarcity. And that's why I don't feel too bad for the people scratching and clawing for tight ends. In some leagues, I started with Kyle Pitts and George Kittle at tight end. And guess what? I'm playing Tyler Conklin a lot more than I want to. But at the same time, it's it's speaking, just... It's, speaking yeah. of Tyler Conklin real quick, week you 17, your championship yeah. week, he gets the Seattle Seahawks, which as of right now the second best matchup according to fantasy pros yeah, for Arizona. opposing tight ends. Yeah. Arizona, and Seattle. <laughs> Dulcich it. gets Arizona in week 15. So if oh, you were really goodness. desperate for a tight end, you could probably weirdly pair Dulcich and Conklin and figure something out the rest of the season. It's not going to be pretty. It may not work. But <laughs> if you look at the matchups, there's actually a lot to be said for it. Yeah, the, the failure rate of the tight end position is quite high, uh, higher than all the other positions. But at the same time, you can you can still maximize your percentage of success by by looking at those sorts of things. Like in reality, you should have been looking at those sorts of things preseason when you're doing your draft. Um, 
a lot of us don't have the time or the or the bandwidth to do that but now that we're there and we're needing to plan accordingly for our championship runs where literally anything can happen once you get in the tournament is six seeds win leagues all the damn time is get into the tournament this is your last week to do it if you're in the playoffs you better be looking at those matchups i actually 15, uh in our yeah. home 15 league. 16 17 yeah weeks in our, 15 in, 16 17 in our home league i had the kansas city defense I knew it wasn't going to be a good matchup this past week, but I looked at what was available and it's like, look, Kansas city has a great run rest of the season. We yeah. talked about it. You hold on to nothing it. that was on waivers was going to guarantee me a win. So I'm just like, you know what? Kansas city may be bad, but I'm just going to play them. If I take the loss, I take the loss. Cause I know I'm in the playoffs and it will be better for me the rest of the season. And boy, did I take that loss with that negative one points they got me. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I I felt it was worth it. Streaming every position except for running back and wide receiver has won me so many championships. Uh, I remember back in 2017 when uh, when when Josh Allen was a rookie. Or was that 2019? I can't remember. It was Josh Allen's rookie year. He was absolutely horrible, most of it. But it got down to week 17. Back then, it was the last week of the year, and I had one league where I was the four seed. I made it in, and I was playing an undefeated team in the championship round. Week 17, nobody's playing. My starting quarterback that year was Drew Brees. I couldn't play Drew Brees. And yeah. I just picked up Josh Allen, and the dude put up 35 points and won me a ship over an undefeated team that had no business be- I had no business beating. So really streaming, it, you can't be above – streaming any position in the playoffs because those matchups matter a lot especially at the tight end position where you basically have no idea who's going to be the tight end one from week to week especially in a part of the season where everybody's going down and there's all sorts of moving parts where vets are getting shelved just because their season's over it's it's a crapshoot and so you're never above streaming an option if they have a great matchup and they're looking at an opportunity that they haven't had all year. You might play a guy that hasn't done anything all year long, but he has that matchup in that week that you need him. So that that would be my advice to anybody who's in the playoffs is look at everything. Look all the way down the list. Look to see who's, whose pattern is trending upward for usage, who has that nice cushy matchup like Tyler Conklin week 17. You bet your ass I have him sitting on the end of my bench waiting for that. Yeah, you know, and it, it I think the the reason this conversation was so important and so, you know, impactful for us to have is because it just further highlights a lot of the same things that we've talked about on this podcast over the last several episodes and that you need to have a broader understanding of what your roster is the closer and closer you get to the prize because there are still people. And it's one of the flaws that I see in waiver articles, which is why I approach it the way that I do, which is I know how you guys approach it the way that you do is that it's serving a different purpose. You are trying to attack certain things with a different purpose and bygone are the days of Stash this guy, wait a month, and see if his usage ramps up. Because guess what? It's double-digit weeks, motherfuckers. That shit's not happening now. so like, hard for people to pick up James Cook and then Mike White the last couple of weeks. I was like, pick up Mike White now, because if you don't pick up now and he has two good games, you're not going to be able to get him for that ch- that amazing schedule at the end of his, play- of his fantasy season. Yeah. And so that's that's and then there's been a few running backs that they, their their schedule got accelerated where like I was saying, hey, stash this guy, stash this guy, Rashad White, stash this guy for the love of God, stash Rashad White. I said it every single week in my article, stash Rashad White, stash Rashad White. And now you can't get him yeah. because he's a quasi starter on a good offense on a team that's on the rise, making a playoff push. I had him in the free portion side of the article, I think at least five times. And I had him behind the paywall. How many other times for the same reasons? Just, I don't know. But, but then James just Cook. To, I don't know how dude, many times I've written about James Cook. Look, it's like now we're seeing it. We are seeing it right now. 100%. This is your last chance. This week is the last chance to get James Cook off waivers. Yeah. And by the time you're hearing this, it's, it's too it's late. It's too late. So, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> but 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 to close the topic and before we get out of here with our outros, I just want to go a little bit more into the Chigga Conquo uh hype. So uh Turf. the <laughs> there, so first of all, shout out Turfs, but then uh so I, I have a pulled up courtesy of four for four because their uh stat explorer is a great resource. Um over the last two weeks, because this is really when it started to pop off, 43.7% uh, route participation rating does not inspire a ton of confidence, but at the same time, a 17.2% target share in the Titans offense. That is a massive leap of involvement for a rookie tight end, a guy that, you know, like watching this man with the Maryland flag on his head, like, He's a big boy that can get that yak, yak, yak. The same kind of way that, like, I mean, it's an imperfect comparison, but, like, what are the same reasons we liked John U. Smith once upon a time, ladies and gentlemen? Like, I'm, ju I'm just saying. I'm just – there's a reason he's stashed on a lot of my Dynasty Taxi squads, but even for redraft people, like, if, if he's heating up like this and it keeps working – that's that's my suggestion. I'm throwing out into the into the wilderness, into the echo chamber. Just go after Chigga Conquo. Like this dude's killing it, dude. <laughs> and and with Traylon Burks probably not going to play with a concussion this next week. Are we? What are we looking at here? Exactly, exactly. You know, and that's why it pays. To We're be... looking at another increase in his pattern. It's increase in the pattern. Increase. You have to look at these things from a sideways perspective. Which is exactly why you tune in to the lateral show, a sideways look at fantasy football on a weekly basis. Boom, that's how you do it. That's how you do the thing. Yes, that is the podcast name. My name is Herms. You can follow me on Twitter at Herms NFL. And in case you didn't see the news on Twitter last week, I have accepted a full time position to join the staff over at Draft Sharks. So. You know, for you fantasy six packers, that means that like I don't know what that means for the future of the podcast necessarily, but I can tell you that it does mean that there is one more waiver column coming out after this week from me, and then I'm handing it over to our buddy Pang's picks, Davis Pang. Pang. He'll pick it up. Shout out, shout out NorCal. Well, you know, it's built different. You know, so that's what I'll be up to. That's where you can find all of my stuff moving forward. My first day on the job is next Tuesday, so that's where I'll be at. Full-time Herms doing his thing. McLateral, where can they find you on the internet? Well, it's your boy McLateral, a.k.a. McLateral FF. You can find me on Twitter at McLateral FF, but you can also find me on Twitter at Mac McMillan ATL. Uh, I am still going to be writing for Fantasy Six Pack through the end of the season, uh, though probably barring Week 17, because I'm going to be going on my honeymoon, and uh, my wife will kill me if I write a fantasy article while we're on vacation. So, uh, yeah, that's not happening. What a way to go uh, out. <laughs> so don't worry, though, up until championship week. And I'm still debating if I might like pre-write just a little something matchup based just just to throw it out there so you get some content. But I will still have the heat check this week. I will have it the next week and I will have it the week after that. So stay tuned for that over at Fantasy Six Pack. Uh, and make sure you're following me on both accounts because I'm going to probably end up be doing more on the Mac McMillan ATL one as time goes on because of my day job over at Tom's Guide where I write about the latest in tech, entertainment, and gaming, all the news, some crazy stuff going on. Like, uh, did you know that Cooler Master has built a $15,000 basically gaming chair with like it turns into a pod and like can support three monitors and it's like Damn. absolutely designed for gamers, but they're like aiming it at businesses and nobody's going to buy this thing, but it's insane. Um, uh, the that, rich, that was the, the thing rich Twitch kid, the, the rich Twitch kids are going to have them. Oh, it'll be interesting to see in the wild. Cause apparently like uh, some people have actually gone and tested them out and surprisingly good. Immersive, but not claustrophobic. Anyway, that's the kind of stuff I write about for my day job over at Tom's Guide. You should go check it out. Go check out Mac McMillan ATL on Twitter. Uh, and for some fantasy football stuff, I'm still around at McLateral FF. So feel free to follow me there, too. And last, but certainly not least, Bo, where can the friendly viewers and or listeners of this 
find you on the interwebs? If you're watching, it's at Bo underscore make big time on Twitter. That is where you'll be directed to my bio, which has a link tree to everything that I work on from Fantasy Pros, three week, three weekly articles from the waiver wire column with Debro and Fitz to my uh, Fantasy Football Storylines, which releases every Wednesday morning. And then my Fantasy Football Hot Takes, the hashtag Picantics, every Thursday morning. Those are my weekly columns for Fantasy Pros. I also write DFS for the Sports Gambling Podcast Network fantasy team. Uh, I do a DFS flow chart on Saturdays and a top 10 stacks of the week on Fridays. So check it all out. You can find all of that on my on my Twitter bio. It's just it's just everything I do is for the people. And yes, I do get paid for my time. <laughs> Speaking of getting paid, <coughs> plug the plans. What was that? Oh yeah, right. So if you want to do the thing with the fantasy six pack, it's uh it's important because you can get behind the paywall for oh there I found it. There we go. You can get behind the paywall for the remainder of my waiver article uh for next week and when Peng starts picking up and doing his, in addition to award winning DFS tools, access to the Discord community. Access to no award winning rankings. I don't think the DFS tools have won awards. Whatever, what they're still good. Jesus. They're still good. I'm just, I said it wrong. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize, Joe, in advance. But like, either way, like, you get a, you get a lot out of it. Seriously, like, really good DFS tools, great. award winning rankings, access to the Discord community, which is super helpful. There's a lot of great conversation that happens there, there and is. so many more things at fantasy six pack.net slash plans. So before I fuck up anything else we are going to end the podcast by hitting the outro we will see you next time this is the lateral show ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen it's, it's the lateral, lateral show, show. fasten your seatbelts because here, here we, we go, go.